Okay, sounds good. Um, so the, for those who have just joined, a uh, uh, warm welcome to you. My name is Fellow Gina Numo. Once again, preferred pronouns she, her, hers. Um, hosting the webinar from Nairobi, Kenya, where we've just had a storm and I had a mild panic um, around the internet connectivity, but this is the reason why we are convening this webinar. I work uh, with the Building, Building Feminist Economies program at AWID and a very warm welcome to you. In the background, of course, is my daughter who will intermittently be providing singing and might make a feature <laughs> for this webinar. So welcoming you all. We are living in unprecedented times. I think these are words that we've probably had so many times when we open a news article, um, when we are getting updates from a media outlet or source. The global pandemic, that is COVID-19, is demonstrating the failures of mainstream capitalism and neoliberalism. The crisis has put a spotlight on weak health systems, gaps in social protection systems, especially for the most vulnerable, labor rights, or lack thereof, the influence and power of corporations, women's unpaid care work, among other things. It has also made it clear that nurturing feminist economies are not only needed in this moment, but they are necessary to renew the process of envisioning another world. While this context highlights the shortfalls of the economic system and the turbulence that we imagine lies ahead, we know that many more people are now working virtually because of the present situation. At the end of this week, AWID will be inviting you all to join us in discussing some of these feminist economic realities. But for now, we wanted to do our best to meet what we feel and what we see as a more immediate need. How do we continue to organize politically in a virtual world? As AWID, we have worked decentrally and worked in a decentralized manner for over 15 years and thought now would be a good time to share some of our lessons and experiences around how we do this, especially in a feminist organization. Earlier this week, we shared a poll amongst AWID members and some of you who have joined to basically ask what do you and what would be most helpful to find out uh, during this webinar. And so in this webinar, we are inviting select AWID colleagues and staff and comrades from FRIDA, the Young Feminist Fund, and the Association for Progressive Communications, APC, to speak to some of these issues. Just checking because I'm getting a notification from support team. And so this is the highlight. Uh, if you can see the slides, these are some of the things that came up in terms of what we would what came from the members in terms of what they would want to see more uh, in order of preference and what we did as the speakers um, and the presenters is to collate this into three of our arcing themes that our speakers will be speaking to today and also drawing on some of your knowledge and ideas so the first thing is going to be around the virtual is political what is the political impetus around the work that we do and how we work virtually um, from the three organizations then secondly, what are some of the practical considerations for a virtual organization? And so what are the policies? What does it look like in practice? And what are some of the tools? And then finally, what is the inspiration and solidarity in times of physical distancing look like? And I think this is an area of interest, especially seeing that we are in this moment. And so without um, further ado, um, it's such a great pleasure and honor to invite my fantastic AWID colleagues and fantastic comrades from APC and FRIDA and to ask the speakers to please introduce themselves, preferred pronoun, your country or movement that you'd like to be associated with, and what is the most exciting thing for you about working virtually. So I'm going to start with you, um, Margarita, Maggie. Hello, hello, hola, hola, toda la gente que me escucha en español. Uh, my name is Margarita Salas. Call me Maggie. I'm a WIDS uh, communications manager. Um, my pronouns, my preferred pronouns are she and her. And what's more exciting for me about working for AWID is I'm very, I feel very connected and very committed to the feminist and LGBT movements in Costa Rica. I have a lot of work to do. And I love that I don't have to leave my country, that I don't have to leave my movements to be able to be part of an international organization. And that has been very exciting, connecting with other feminists who are still living in their country and working from their countries and being able to then get a sense of
different parts of the world and also seeing how how they live uh, work and distance and, and, and all those challenges and feminism from their own countries. So this is very exciting for me about working at a distance, being able to really connect globally with others. Please introduce yourself. My name is Faye Macheke. I'm based in Cape Town. I am the Director of Finance and Operations at AWIT. I love working in my country where I don't have to go to an office. I can prepare my day. I love the personal connection I have with everybody that I work with, <clears throat> that they're only a message away. And I love that um, from a politics point of view, I'm able to add and hear and be able to adapt so much to what's going on in the world and feed into um, a, a disruptive system, which is much harder to do in an office environment. Thank you. To you, ladies. Um. I think that uh, you have a lot of control, but you have a lot of um, control over how you like uh, are able to conduct your presence online. So if you want to be anonymous and you still want to work at an organization, um, that's a possibility. And I think that has also led to um, the entry of a lot of activists who would not, who would otherwise be very suspicious of online working precisely because of the data grabs and of the issues. Uh, so I think that adding to what other people have said, which is also like the flexibility, you know, and the ability to work with, with people across the world, um, to have a, to cover different time zones as well, that's really important in terms of communications because you can react a, on time whenever. Um, and yeah, I think also another another aspect of working online um, is like the ability to yeah to access other like cultures and languages. So it, it's easier to translate something like a document uh, or an email. Uh, so there's a lot more possibility for other types of connection as well. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> So great, ladies, and I, I can tell you, I was very excited about um, working from home because you jumped. It. Very excited about um, working from home because you jumped it right into the question. So I'm going to hand it back to you just to introduce yourself and your fantastic organization. <laughs> um, advocacy communications and tech manager at Frida, the Young Feminist Fund, and my pronouns are she and her. Fantastic, ladies. Over to you, Erica. So what I'm doing is removing my cover on my camera. Deet, deet. Because you know, and APC, we're always talking about digital safety and care, and I keep that camera covered uh, unless I really need you to see me. And I probably won't need you to see me most of the rest of the time, but I am Erica Smith. I work for the Women's Rights Program at the Association for Progressive Communications. And I do a lot of work on gender-based violence online and accompaniment work as well. Uh, and around the Take Back the Tech campaign um, that many of you have participated in in many different ways. Uh, and I think everybody has covered a lot of what I most love about working virtually, but um, I, I think what I appreciate is the political and feminist nuance that I can get uh, from and that we enjoy from all of our different teammates that are located in so many different countries in the Association for Progressive Communication. So you really understand when there is um, an internet policy that's affecting someone, uh, how, it, how it plays out in different places or what it would it mean in authoritarian context versus um, a context where people are able to participate much more in the decision making in their lives or where uh, women have agency. So it's, it's very interesting to have all of those perspectives. Um, I think sometimes the, the other thing is that it, it really allows for um, different types of teammates. You know, it, I think that it's very hard to get 
a lot of people in one office, and that's going to make that can make your office homogeneous. And so it is, uh, and 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 this is not in any way to erase the incredible privilege that is needed to be able to have online connectivity, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to be able to participate remotely. But I think that it uh, allows for a lot more diversity in in team as well. And that inter a fabulous feminist interconnection is what I love about remote work. So now I'm coming back at my camera, and I probably won't use it because it does affect bandwidth for me to, to, to transmit. Thank you, as well as for joining. I think the internet connectivity is quite a challenge during this time. And certainly we're going to come back to some of the things that you're raising because of your, the context is also shifting. Um, and we are seeing even with the push for, you know, virtual organizing is increasing authoritarianism and, you know, policies that could increase surveillance on our information. So coming back to you that, for, to you for that, but quickly moving to Mariana um, to kind of introduce herself. Mariana, why? Uh, I am everybody, I'm Mariana from Uruguay, part of the APC WRP team. Um, I work uh, as a gender IT editor. Gender IT is a blog about gender policy, internet, and technology. And I am part of the knowledge building team also. Uh, the most I love uh, to work um, uh, in this organization, in this movement, is uh, to enrich my feminism with other feminist realities. Uh, the feel of uh, internationalism, uh, uh, when, when you are in touch, when you are working in net, in, on international networks, the feel that that you can connect, for example, Latin American realities with African realities uh, with a feminist lens. So that's that, that's, uh, that I like to, to, to work uh, uh, as a feminist internationally. And working uh, remotely, I like uh, the options to work uh, in different modalities with different methods, with different mediums. Uh, you can choose, for example, to use uh, synchronous or as, as asynchronous tools. Uh, you can write, you can make videos, you can make podcasts, you can create different things with different mediums to um, uh, for different audience. So uh, I think that uh, the, possibility, the opportunity to change and to experiment between all all these mediums are the one of my favorite things to to work online uh, and to work around uh, feminist movements and feminist content. I think there's an excellent resource that has been shared um, in the chat. And we'll come back to some of these issues. And I think over to you. I'm not. I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. I think it's Vale, but let's hear. Okay. Let's solve the how to pronounce, huh? It's an invented name, doesn't exist, Hall. Balkans, Hall means thanks. I'm an Italian living in Bosnia, working with IPC. Uh, internet for me is pleasure, it's fantasy and bypassing border. That's, uh, I think, and it's about possibility really to take care of each other, to talk. Um, that's for now. I'm very curious also to hear the others, not only to talk because I have the privilege you now from this side. And I go off. Let's get right into the issues. I think one of the things um, around why we organized this webinar was the feminist ways of working. And so I want to start with Maggie to just situate us in terms of 
why is AWID working virtually? What does it mean for us politically? Um, and what are some of the learnings over the years? Hi. Yes, um, AWID wasn't always a virtual organization, a virtually based organization. We, we were headquartered um, in the north and the organization started wanting to have stronger leadership and stronger participation of uh, folks based in the south, in the south of, of southern staff. And to do this, one of the things that we started to wonder was how do we really involve um, folks from different countries in all over the world? And it was a political decision to be able to say, well, if we really want to involve people who are connected to their communities, who are working from their countries and from the south, we need to start finding remote ways of working. And this is something that we think of as an international organization, but I think it can also be something we think of within a national context. Maybe we're based in the capital of a country, and maybe we want people from the different towns in the country to be able to participate of our organization, but they don't want to move. They don't want to uh, lose connection to their communities, or they can't move to another city. So that's also a good reason to think about um, remote remote work because politically it has implications whose voices you're involved in in the international spheres. Organizations that work internationally tend to also uh, go work at very um, global spaces and it's important that the messaging and, and that the issues really come from the people who are on the ground in different places and that for us is one of the reasons why the organization decided if we really want to be southern led we need to find ways to let people who are in the south those of us who are in the south to be able to really be part of the organization and that's one of the reasons that it would decided this having a feminist approach to to work means a lot of things and i'm sure Faye will talk about this a little bit more regarding um human right uh, human resources policies regarding because when we work, we have to also remember that all of our circumstances come with us. Do we have children? Do we not? How good an internet do we have? How good a connectivity do we have? Do we um, have other challenges that we have to face? How about safety in our country? So all of these are thoughts that you have to think about, as well as uh, the coordination between time frames, knowing and respecting that everyone has a time in which they are going to be working and a time in which they are not. So some of the challenges that also arise from this is knowing, for example, if I supervise staff and I have um, Cecile that uh, works um, our, our web portal and I need something from her, then that means that I have to ask it at least a day in advance because she is in Stockholm. And then by the time I connect, she's gonna be ending her day. And likewise, if I need to get something from my supervisor, from my direct boss who's, uh, in Ghana, then that means I need to ask her with time because our time frames are not going to be the same. So this is also for me uh, a reflection about respecting each person's time frame and working hours and not thinking that my time is everybody's time. So I think that uh, virtual work has also uh, come um, for, for us with a lot of reflections regarding how to respect people's labor rights, how to strengthen their participation in their own uh, environment, and how to take care of each other. That's, and I think also underlying what you're saying, and, and I'm hearing quite strongly, is how the way we work is also resistant, you know, to capitalism ways and capitalist production, you know, uh, limiting people from eight to five, assigning that rest days are over the weekend. And so how do we reflect that in our politics, in our work, um, in our care, you know, we have, like you said, we have cats that usually come, all, all these children, and how do we respond to that uh, without being alarmed that this is a working space and knowing um, that, you know, it's part of our resistance to capitalism. And I think that's why it's important to tag Faye, like you said at this point, because this also influences the resources, the tools, and the policies, and I would like to invite Faye to just speak to this. Um, So there's so much to speak about on, on HR, but I thought that just given the time we're in, perhaps I could just jot down a few thoughts in terms of how we thought about HR. And what's interesting in working in a 
in a virtual environment is that you have your HR principles, but they it almost you have to turn it upside down, and then the the HR principles have to conform to how you work. You have to think about the time frames uh, that people work in, as Maggie was 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 talking about. Uh, when you want to have organization wide meetings, how does that work? Um, the space for for staff to work in that they have the right tools to work that they have the right connectivity and this can get really tricky in terms of um, areas where the connectivity is quite quite uh, low so you might have a meeting where some people are on video for example and some people are not because they're just not able to connect um, then you've got to think about productivity as well um, in terms how do we make sure that we're reaching our objectives um, what kind of check-ins do we have? How do we make sure that um, we are able to supervise? So finding the right tools. In AWID, we use Asana um, in, in terms of arranging our work and making sure that we're all aware of what people are doing. We also use Slack because connection becomes really, really important. Um, and we are able to make connections, not only work connections, but we also have social connections such as a with parents or a with plants or whatever else and whatever other channels that we decide to work in just so that we can also develop relationships with, with our colleagues. Um, we've also thought about rest time. So leave work how does leave work in different, as in addition to just working virtual, virtually, as you know, we're in an in international organization. So we had to come up with leave that works for everybody. Uh, and I read in an article, and especially in these times about sick leave, where um, we have set leave, we have set sick leave, but we've developed ways in which we can support um, the staff. And we have something that's called a sick leave pool, where people are able to access more sick leave should they need it. And in all that, at the base of all that, we want to make sure that there's equal equal work for equal pay. So we also develop structure, we've also developed structures to make sure that people are rewarded um, the same wherever they may be globally. Shall I just stop there for now, Fellow Jean? Coming back to you, um, thank you so much for sharing that. I'm wondering if you have a particular example that you want to share, but I also noticed that I cut you off. So just coming back to you, Faith, for this. Repeat yourself. Off when you were about to say something, and I thought that it was going to be sharing a particular example, but just clarify for me so that then I can move on to ladies. Actually, I'm just going to answer a question that uh, Miriam uh, asked, which is, is Asana and Slack trusted, re-sensitive information? Um, do, do they have policies re-data sharing? Um, yes, we do have data sharing policies, but in terms of Asana and Slack, it really is used only within the organization and um, um, we make sure that all our information stays there. We have a different way of sharing um, of sharing with external people. I think I'll leave it here for now. I think that was really useful. Um, I think Erica will also be coming to respond to the question around security, especially um, with sharing information and open source software. But I just want to hand it over to ladies because I think one of the things um, they have recently shared and uh, politicizing is the happiness manifest. Uh, and that talks about happiness being central to the organizing that we do. And so what is some of the politics that drives FIDA's work, especially being a young feminist-led organization and that funds young feminist-led organizations? I'm thinking and reflecting a lot about virtual working and its ability to sort of like enter your private life <laughs> and also how um, it's kind of very easy to just kind of work um, like a an, 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 uh, general number of hours because you're online it, it's also very easy to just connect on your phone and look at your email to wake up and look at your work email 
Um, so, like in 2017, we were we had a discussion about that. We were like, it's not a, it's not like it's not a good practice for us. It's not healthy for us to wake up and like immediately like access our email, for example. It's not healthy for us to. A travel and connect to a hotspot, um, not healthy and not safe, no? Um, and so we, we developed like um, a methodology that um, where we sort of like wrote our worst um, habits um, in terms of like care, taking care of ourselves at work uh, and working in a virtual office. Um, and from that, we developed a, a few principles that are around like respecting each other's time zones um there's a there's a few commitments that we have they're like agreements <laughs> um and it's like a collective agreement you know we all hold each other responsible and accountable for that um so it's not it like um it's not like a tool to be like hey like you're not caring for yourself like go or like you know because sometimes it can be like that <laughs> um but more like we have agreed that, you know, we are not sending emails on Sunday and that that this is a way of respecting your colleagues like and, and yourself, of course. Um, and so this language and like this tool, this the Happiness Manifesto has given us a, a language to be able to have these dialogues with one another and establish boundaries without being um, restrictive and like without being, you know, I don't know how to say this, but like to we are being like authoritative, and that is really important because one of the ways in which we work and uh, and as a youth led organization, we believe in like you know autonomy and like self direction and um, and this is very crucial to our virtual work because you have to be self disciplined, you have to be like very proactive with communication, you have to be uh, transparent with your work, um, you have to you have to just be like a, a lot more accountable in different ways that I feel like if you were in an office and people would see you coming into the office and like meeting your times and all of these things. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a work in progress and we definitely still break our boundaries and uh, some of us has, have Slack on our phones and uh, <laughs> and things like that. Like, um, but we are, we're all trying and what that's what it matters, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And I think it's a particularly strong point, um, especially. And I think it's a particularly strong point, um, especially now, because the romanticization of working virtually, I think, is, is actually being made visible, um, especially around the care work, you know, and all of us have been um, thrust into a situation where we have to do extra caring. So whether it's caring for ourselves, caring for the elderly, caring for the sick, um, and trying to work in the same space, I think, is something that has to be politicized as well in this moment. But then secondly, I think, is also the issue around security of the tools, because now um, the fact that we are required to physically distance ourselves means that we are in a moment where we are in need of tools to continue to be connected, um, but also be careful around, you know, the surveillance. And so inviting Erica to respond to some of the concerns around the tools that we use for online work, as well as the security issues around them. Hey, so can everyone hear me all right? Um, despite the heavy sigh, because you know, it is really important to talk about pleasure and happiness and not just about safety. So I'm very glad that I got <laughs> preceded by those concepts because, and we find a lot when we do different digital safety um, aspects that it's really important to remember the main reason why we are doing this remote connecting. And I know it's gonna sound weird, but you know, um, it, it's, it's like if you're, if you're into sexting, you will enjoy your sexting more if you're sure of your connection <laughs> and you have thought through some things, but it's kind of hard to have safety in mind in the middle of an excitingly hot sexting session, right? So, <laughs> so um, it is kind of a drag always to be talking about um, safety and have to have it in mind and also have to sort of hone your tools and your knowledge on a regular basis because technology is always changing. So what we might learn and what we might hear as a recommendation last year maybe changes this year. So, and that's happening a lot right now, for example, with our online voice platforms for communication. For example, 
In Mexico, the way that the government, government has been able to surveil and monitor many activists and journalists is using malware that was easily sent through Skype. Um, and so there's a lot of distrust of Skype in many activist organizations in Mexico, just as one example. And of course, Skype, owned by Microsoft, is, um, has had agreements with governments, such as the Chinese governments, to have back doors installed. So for us, if we're looking at a feminist practice of technology, we're really interested in who's developing the tools, what sort of information are they giving us? I mean, how many of us really looked at that privacy policy today as we logged into VoiceBox? I know I read it, um, and I still had some questions about it, but I proceeded. Um, so I think that it's really important to think about who is making the tools and for what purpose, and always to remember that a lot of times with a commercial purpose, they are solving a practical need, but there is money vested in it, and there is government control over it, depending where the company is based. And this can become very sensitive, depending on the type of work we're doing, especially as women human rights defenders, for example, uh, in specific countries. So one of the things that we try to do in ABC, and we do not always achieve it, and also this is really key. It's all about who has access where. And so it's really easy to you know, get up on a high horse and say, you know, this is the best tool. But in reality, if it's hard for people to use in local communities or if what people are using is, uh, makes sense for them and it's a commercial tool or it's one that maybe has less security options, maybe it's recognizing that that has to be used, but then alerting to the security concerns so that it's used differently. You, moder you change your practice if you can't change your tool. Um, so just to give a couple of examples of some of the essential tools that we use in our online work, and I'm going to be generic and then I will talk about some specific names, but um, I think that uh, as, we, as we look at different platforms, and I know that a lot of us on this call can talk to more, but, and I had this whole list and now I'm like, where's my list? We, uh, we would always want a collaborative documentation space. And that can be like real time that everyone can use, such as an Etherpad, um, or it could be a shared document that people are going to be working on asynchronously as well. Um, sometimes a shared document space where we can upload and download different things and have shared storage is very useful. Uh, many people have used the um, very nefarious Google Docs, and I say nefarious because Google Drive and Google Docs is um, under fire for what Google does in terms of privacy invasion. So in APC, we have installed our cloud on our own server. So that's a luxury because we're an organization that has its own server and can do that sort of an install. Um, so that's, that's one example. And we also use pads. We can use them of other servers or other ether pad services, and that's great for collaborative note-taking. And by the way, collaborative note-taking is really useful in a multilingual environment or when connection drops because you can check in the pad as people have been taking notes what you missed. Um, it also gives a lot of confidence that you are part of the conversation, even if you couldn't connect at a certain time zone, for example. Sharing that documentation and sharing the responsibility of documentation is really important. Another tool that's really important that is open source that we use is how to set an appointment together straddling all those time zones. So we use something called Framadate, um, framadate.org, and that is the equivalent of what more people might know called Doodle, which has a lot of ads on it and is not open source. Um, so uh, we, with Framadate, can just check what's the best time for everyone because we want to be flexible. We don't, I mean, we might all start our work days in the morning, but what's the morning for you and what's my morning? Or maybe for you, because you're doing homeschooling right now, it's better to work in the afternoon. So giving a flexibility of dates using a time scheduler, and we use, again, Framadate, is very useful. Um, we also think a lot about the... Uh, sharing space that we have. And so instead of using Slack, which we loved, uh, it is a community space where you can chat, you can share documents, you can have conversations that divided up in different channels, uh, and it can work asynchronously as well as in real time. So it's a wonderful team communications uh, and connectivity tool. Um, we love Slack, but we moved to a FOSS option that we control on our server as well called Mattermost. And the reason why we talk a lot about free and open source or soft, 
uh, or FOSS options is because you can have the code checked and you know there are no back doors. The reason for the development is a much more community focus. So there's a feminist, collaborative, political um, thrust, uh, not a commercial thrust behind it. And you can say things like, damn it, Zoom, why is your hand white? And why can't we have different colored hands in Zoom? And you can write to the collaborators and complain, and there might be more of a response. Uh, you can also translate it to make it work in your language. There's a lot of reasons we could go on and on about open source software. But just to go back to the security element, I think one thing that happens immediately is that a lot of us are using our home computers when we do remote work, and a lot of people in our home need access to it. So this is where we need to start thinking about how can we compartmentalize our information? Should we have everything on a hard drive that has a password or is encrypted so that our families don't have access to that information? Not because they're nosy, just because you want to keep that information safe and for your organization. Similarly, as you're doing collaborative documents, where are you storing them? So there's um, points about where we share and put our data and what data we put where. And there's also points about wanting to protect our channel of communication. So for a lot of people, an essential, essential tool is going to be a virtual private network or VPN so that you have an encrypted communication channel with your teammates. There are many other points that I'm sure others can add into, but I did want to say something that I think is essential. And I really appreciated um, what Ledis was saying about when you do uh, remote work, uh, there's more transparency required. There's almost um, there's more self-discipline required. And I think different personalities might need different ways to congregate online and communicate and get brainstorm, et cetera. And we have different tools and ways that we do that we can talk about. But to be accountable, to be transparent, does take a bit of time. Um, and, uh, you know, checking in every day saying, this is what I want to achieve today, and, this, and then when you leave, I got this done today, is a one way of being accountable without having to be uh, supervised. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trying to express a difference because I think that any workers, not just young workers, <laughs> really feel the chafe of having to spend a lot of time account of being accountable rather than doing work. And being online does not mean you are working. So I think that's another aspect that we must recognize that remote work means a lot of times you're not connected because it's when you're not connected that you can focus and get work done. But most importantly, in APC, this is something I've not seen in many other organizations, there is an implicit trust. We are always checking in. We have back channels for checking in through instant messaging, which could be Signal, Telegram, or WhatsApp, depending on the group that you're in, as an example. Um, but what I think is really important is that if someone is not reporting, we want to know how they are, but it's an issue of trust. If we didn't understand or if we were offended by something that got said, we ask, we don't assume there was harm meant because it is so easy to have that sort of miscommunication. So when we're talking about feeling safe online, it's not just the tools we use, it's the way we interact with them and with each other. I'll stop there. <laughs> Take um, just two things. One, to share that we will be uh, following up with the recording of the webinar and all the amazing resources that Erica mentioned. Um, because I know, you know, even for me, and I think for AWID, it's always a constant learning curve. And then secondly, I really love also what you shared about, you know, what it means to work virtually. And, uh, you know, in moments where they say social distancing, I think for me, um, working virtually has meant a lot of social intimacy. Uh, it's not very often that, you know, you invite people to your bedroom, to your sitting room. But when we have calls and when you have video calls, you know, this is a space that you're opening and people are able to see you in some of your most um, intimate forms, right? Um, and I think also with this crisis, because a lot of us are actually pushed into these virtual ways of working, um, it's also a moment and an opportunity for change and transformation. Um, and so we, I just want to hand it back to you all and share with us in the spirit of what are the learning moments that we are having at this time? How can we connect a bit more? I think, Tamara, you had already begun to share uh, some of the challenges around activist um, profiles being deleted, some of the legislation that was on the table, and we might see a lot more legislation coming up in the next few days. 
but we also know that this can set precedents for the wrong thing. So how can we also set precedents for ourselves in terms of solidarity actions, in terms of how do we enhance our social connections during this moment? And so I invite you now to just share this um, in the chat box and we'll be able to, to pick up on those ideas. So maybe just five minutes to type up what are some of the solidarity um, actions that we are witnessing in this moment, some of the tools, some of the ways that we are connecting virtually. Oh, sorry. So I'm going to repeat myself uh, and perhaps more slowly and clearly. So asking um, participants, because we are taking a break from the presenters and we'll come back to them in five minutes, but just wanting to hear from you either through text, and I think you have a button that you can raise um, if you want to speak around what are some of the solidarity actions we're witnessing, what are some of the ways that people are connecting. Um, okay. So Tamara, and you can also speak because I'd be able to see if you request for the floor. Um, there's a feature that allows you to click on it if you want to speak on the floor. So thanking us and thank you, thank you to our fantastic um, presenters and interpreters as well for the fantastic job they are doing. I think Tamara, you're sharing around mutual aid and solidarity actions that are happening. Sibyl, sharing up meals means some funny videos, yoga, meditation, and you know, talk about the wild path and how you're sharing stories, music and playlists that are being shared. Yes, it's quite interesting how we are able to get um, DJ playlists uh, for shows that would have been out of our reach. So I think that's a very interesting one as well in terms of arts and creative expression. Being intentional about being personal. So how do you uh, be more open, share things on a personal level with colleagues and talking about that and not just always using the one hour to get into work and only work sharing funny pictures of ourselves and our pets, and lots of live stream on Instagram. So I think Nabila, you can click on the hand if you'd like to speak. Having the time to call. Amazing. Oh, Irina, that's interesting. So you decided to write nothing about coronavirus at our pages or in our chat because there's a lot of informational pressure on that happening and you know, even how the mainstream is is doing an overload with this kind of information I think is, is an interesting decision to make in this time. So appreciating that. Okay. Okay, so I think we'll continue to get the responses. Nabila, I'm not able to see your request. Maybe if you can type it in, we'd be able to collect that as well. Yeah, and it, the challenges of working remotely is information overload. I think. Pala from Paraguay also highlights 
you know the issues around connectivity and also in light of human rights defense work as we continue to share that i would come back to the presenters as well and just um for you to share any of you know the solidarity actions that are inspiring you and if there are any other comments based on what you're reading from the chat box so i'm going to start with you ladies because i saw um yeah so at frida we created a, a coronavirus specific news channel we did feel like it was important to say something in our communications but something that was very important to me uh, was that we didn't you know everything was like a lot of the emails that i got for like a week was like COVID 19 in the like in the subject line and that was like super overwhelming so we didn't actually use that word until like well below and because we just wanted to have like a conversation about what what is happening right now and also allow people to have a moment before they can like see what we're doing but yeah uh, that was really important for us um but yeah I, something that i want to also mention here is that um even though like i think there's a lot of anxiety around around like young feminist collectives in this time because a lot of them um really value like in person work and like local like work and it's like usually they're like a group of friends or at least like a group of people who know each other and care for each other um and i think that like the inability to connect physically has been has led to a lot of anxiety uh, but people have been bouncing and like moving towards more towards like virtual spaces but there but i am like there's a lot of concern and there's a lot of anxiety that i have about people like uh, starting to but because in online uh, so for example if you use zoom you have to give your name and you have to give your email and all of these things that like you probably didn't have to do if you went to a space or if you went to a collect unless you wanted to no and um that's that's difficult and i think that a lot of people also don't know how to handle anonymization or do anonymization so uh, they end up like you know identifying themselves in different platforms to talk about uh, their activism their organizing and i think that's really uh concerning <laughs> um and yeah like there are like I, I know that there's a lot of discussion about like platforms and i think something that we want to do from advocacy at frida is to uh, give like create a resource where we can say like hey look like these are the these are some of the platforms these are some of their benefits these are some of their downfalls because no platform um there's no platform is perfect right now um, and so and to share that with the, with our grantee partners and to share that with our with the community with our community on social media so that people can be more informed when they make these decisions um and that they can they can you know make this flexible change um but still like i do think that uh, as a funder and i think as a like i think that the role that we should be playing in this space is to fund uh, like these dialogues and fund the creation of feminist infrastructure and the creation of feminist platforms like they're like as black but like feminist <laughs> and like because i think Everybody, let me just hand it over to Maggie and see if it's my connection. Just one second. Hi, uh, was hi, uh, was Lady Santo? I, I I thought she was uh, still making a, a point around uh, feminist uh, infrastructure for technology. Oh, and ladies is ladies is back. So let's let me hand over to ladies before I come over to you, Maggie. If that's okay. Thank you. I'll just 
finish very quickly. I think that, um, yeah, I think it is really important that we are like thinking about how to create technology for ourselves. So what is assume that it can be created like a, a video message like or that we can work with um, that that is based on our principles of feminism, like and of free technology and like knowledge and protection and safety and care. Um, and I think that organizations and donors particularly play a key role um, in starting to use that technology and becoming more comfortable, like, for example, what Erica was saying, you know, using a, a, their own servers, like transitioning to a technology that is that, that actually reflects what we want to do and that is sourcing from the community that we work with. Um, and not with like corporatized technology that it usually actually doesn't even understand <laughs> what we do. Um, but yeah, that was my conclusion. Thank you so much. Awful <laughs> conclusion that is. Over to Maggie as well. I wanted to also, I wanted to also reflect a little bit on processes because sometimes, for me, technology technology is like a river. And it's a river we swim in, in the sense that we can do different things with it. And we can work synchronously and asynchronously. Synchronously meaning at the same time, and asynchronously not at the same time. And this is something that's good to consider, because when we don't have connectivity that is very strong, we might not be able to connect at the same time. And it's also okay to be able to think of ways of working at a distance using technology, but not necessarily at the same time because maybe our connection is not strong enough for video, or maybe it's not strong enough for audio. So then maybe we leave each other messages in a messaging platform, you know? Uh, one of the practices that we have at AWIT that I find very useful are our weekly check-ins. So uh, when you supervise other folks, or you work with other folks, you have a weekly check-in with them. That means there is a moment, an hour, that you schedule every week to uh, sit down with that person and talk with them. Uh, to see how they are doing, to see how the work that they're doing is uh, progressing or not, if they're having challenges. So it's good to find a moment every week to see how the other person is, is doing personally, on, on a personal level, their family, their friends, their life, and also to see how the work is progressing. The other thing that I like is that whenever we start a meeting, we have what we call an icebreaker, which is um, we have a moment in in... In, at the beginning of each meeting where we have uh, a space to talk about more personal things and, and to break the ice, if you will, because we know that we don't want to just dive into the work immediately, but want to uh, have like a, a small dynamic. So maybe it's talking about if you could have a superpower, what would it be? If you were a food, what food would you be? Or, you know, and this might seem silly, but it's important to also connect uh, with our happiness, with our joy. It's important to connect with each other's joy and creativity. Um, and the other thing that I that I like is the possibility of uh, having uh, the schedules all in a in a shared schedule. That's that's important because then when you're going to plan a meeting, you know you know when uh, when other folks are available and when they're not available. So when you think about if you were working face to face and now because of the emergency you're having to move online or you're not being able to meet, it's important to see what were the, how, how was it that you were working at that moment and then how that can be translated to a, to a virtual space and what that means, you know. Does it mean that we have one meeting a week with everyone and then another meeting with fewer of us and then we follow up on the work and then so that we can have this, uh, this process of working together, not just uh, the tools, but also the process in how we use them, when we meet online, when we send an email, when we send a chat, and, and this, is, uh, this is part of realizing that work processes have a big part in, in being able to, to follow things online. Very specific tips. And also the things that we have to, you know, think about as we are making some of the either temporary or possibly considering the virtual ways of working. Erica, coming back to you as well, I think there are questions largely around security, WhatsApp, Telegram. Um, you can touch on that briefly, but also knowing that we'll continue to share the open source um, software and any final last uh, proposals, you know, for us to think about during this time. 
Um, wow, I, I, I'm sorry I'm having a really hard time following the chat because every time someone puts in a new comment, it jumps back for me, so I, I can't actually scroll the chat to see what the specific questions were. But I think there is always a debate about, oh, what's the most secure channel or what's the most secure option? And it really does go back to your practice. Um, I will never forget, I think this is a very important example, how long ago I was in a training with sexual rights and, uh, activists and uh, a young woman was sharing how she, in her Facebook profile, had over 3,000 um, friends. And people, other sexual rights activists were like, how can you do that? You know, do you know every single one of those people who are your friends? And she's like, it's an, um, oh gosh, what is the word in English? An anime, anime? Uh, do you say anime in, in English? Um, it's an anime uh, profile. I, of course, have... You know, I'm anonymous, I share, people don't know who I am, it's, it's private, you know, no one actually knows where or who I am. Um, and I, I thought it's, it's really what we're using each space for that then allows us to discuss different channels. That's very important to think about. And I asked that group, I said, how many people have had sex with someone where you don't know their name? <laughs> and you're telling her how many friends she can have in a group. So <laughs> I, I, really, I really think, you know, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> for, for many people, it doesn't matter if you know their name or if you're even having sex online, I, <laughs> for example. Or, so what I would say is if we're talking about what's the different levels of security, uh, when I'm having conversations that I am particularly concerned about, um, I never use a mobile phone. I would use a Signal encrypted phone call, and I use Signal chat when I feel that they are highly sensitive one-on-one -on -one conversations, for example. But the reality is for group chats, a lot of times I find Telegram and WhatsApp more comfortable. One, that's because it's the tool that people have, uh, and two, it's because um, uh, they, they have different features. But I'm very conscious about what I discussed there and what relationships are exposed there. So you need to make those decisions. If you have a massive WhatsApp group, what are your privacy settings within that group? Is it necessary that you stay there? Who else can see you? Um, what do you do or what actions or protocols or practices do you take in that group to keep it a healthy sharing environment where everyone feels comfortable and not drowned out in memes or suddenly having to deal with dick pics? You know, so there's a lot about what your protocols are and what your practices are. But I will be honest, WhatsApp is encrypted, but the minute that it backs up to your Google Drive or whatever account you have associated, it's not necessarily encrypted any longer. And furthermore, who owns WhatsApp? Facebook does, and they capitalize on information that isn't necessarily our conversation, but is our phone number to be able to do private broadcasting messages and, and sell our contact information. And we saw how this was abused, for example, during electoral processes in Brazil to be able to target right-wing groups with certain kinds of um, uh, homophobic uh, fear messages to get the current, um, I guess he's called the president of Brazil elected. So. Um, I, 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 we do think that who owns the tool matters because their interests are not ours. So again, pushing back to what Ledis is saying about how it is important for us to own as much as we can and understand if we are not doing the install, it, to understand what is behind it, who has access, what updates need to be made. Um, if we are updating our, our phones, our security patches, if we are using an antivirus, that will make any of the systems that we do decide to use safer. Um, and, and we can go into a lot more detail, but I think it's hard to do so right now. I'm sure many others would have lots more to add. And if you know that there's a specific question that needs answering, if you could just let me know what it is, and I would, um, I would uh, happily um, uh, answer that. Um, we have been using RiseUp VPN. Uh, RiseUp is one is an independent network and is also uh, a member of APC um, because we're both a network and an organization. Uh, but uh, we also use a lot of different ones uh, that have different levels of commitment. The, one of the things that's really important is to know if you have to pay for your VPN, you know, is, this, is that something that you can do? Um, and do you trust that organization with your credit card? 
they would have certain information about you. So they would, they are the only ones that can go back to you. So you want to have what they call a trusted VPN provider um, that, that uh, uh, if you're using your your if you're making online payments for it, um, you wouldn't you might want to think about geez would I rather have my uh, provider be based in a country that is not the United States for example uh, because they are more likely to have uh, to to give information or be requested to give information over to the government um, or that's not in my own country for example uh, for that same reason so those that might be some of the questions to think about with a virtual. Um, private network provider, but there are lots of free and open source virtual private network providers where you don't have to exchange that kind of information so that you can stay um, uh, more anonymous. Being completely anonymous is hard. <laughs> Sharing all that, those gems. And I think one of the things um, that you know you're raising is also how, how does our political organizing help us dismantle corporate power? And I think especially with virtual organizing, this is something so central. And, and thank you just for sharing your thoughts and everybody also in the general chat giving the ideas. Over to you, Faye, for your final remarks. Thank you, fellow Jane. I just wanted to go back to, um, we were talking about tools and one of the things we've seen is that hardware also plays an important role we've had to look at um, the, the hardware that our staff uses and how they can be supported in the countries that they, they're in. So it's quite important that we all are using the same kind of hardware. We are able to get support when we need it. We have a warranty. Uh, we have warranty offices where our staff can be able to use that hardware and that that hardware can be able to work with some of the tools that um, we introduce. And so again, it works into our HR policies. And then it's uh, just talking about collaboration. It's, it's really important that that connection space is there. And especially in this time period when there are some people like single parents, single uh, mothers that are, or single people that are feeling really lonely at this time without the, the usual connections that they have. So. Whichever way we connect, I mean, we use Slack, we, we may also use WhatsApp, but it's important that um, people are using that, and it's important that our policies then follow onto, um, onto the tools that we're using. So, for example, in our Slack channels, uh, people would put whether they're away um, <clears throat> or whether they are working today or on leave, etc., so people know not to, not to communicate with them. And then in our Google calendars, uh, people have to put in what times they're working. So when you're setting meetings, you don't have to keep calling them and asking them if they're free. You can see exactly when, when they're free so that you can make the appointment and set up uh, meetings. And then when you do have your meeting, you have a space to collaborate um, on, on your documents. And we do use Google Docs, and I know that there are arguments for and against it, but it, at, at this moment is working for us. up to, we, thank you for indulging us because we're even nine minutes past the hour. This was extremely ambitious, but extremely needed given the circumstances. And so we tried, you know, to kind of have a very difficult conversation an expansive conversation in one hour. Um, and we are certainly looking forward to find out if it was helpful and what are some of the areas that would be interesting for you uh, as a follow up. And so just sharing in the chat, um, a survey for the webinar. And, and, and please take a few minutes. Um, I'll just pause for a few minutes for us to fill that out before we come and, and share the final information that will only take two minutes. Um, again, I think Leila has shared the link. I've also shared the link. Please, please fill that out for us because it will help us prepare for this and also any follow-up information that we can, we can share alongside the recording. As we said, um, we are going to have, uh, at the end of this week, an invitation for, for us to unpack more on feminist economic realities. What does this look like? Certainly the issue around building our own feminist infrastructure. What are some of the examples that are coming up around virtual organizing that are building on our feminist political visions? And it would be fantastic if 
um, a lot of you can join us and partner with us in amplifying and highlighting some of these examples. Thank you so much to our interpreters, you know, for being with us for the fantastic interpretation so far and throughout the webinar. Thank you to the amazing, amazing presenters who I think had a very difficult job of synthesizing a lot of information um, into a few minutes. Um, thank you for indulging us and for, for sharing all this information. And thank you all for staying with us beyond the one hour and also sharing with us your useful insights, uh, tools that you're using, solidarity actions and mutual aid. We'll be sure to follow up with a recording and a resource list after this. I'm going to just stay on so that we are able to get the links for the survey and to fill those out. Shireen, can I invite you just talk about AWID membership it's, and the new online space that we'll be creating? Hi. So, hi. So hopefully that can work. So I just wanted to start by thanking everyone for their participation today. It was great to see. Um, just to let you know, we have a community of AWID members, 6,000 members all over the world that's growing. And it's an exciting year for our membership. We're looking to launch a new strategy to see how to make it more accessible, to better support the movements around the world um, and their needs, and to see how our members can better engage and connect with each other. So um, we're on the verge of launching a Slack community for members who are artists and creative. Um, and we're looking to see how we can expand more connectivity to others as well. So if you're not an AVID member, I would encourage you to go to our site and use the option to sign on and you can sign on for free and we can start to use a member directory to connect with others and the platform. Um, also, please do fill out the survey or just email us and let us know what you thought of the conversation today, what you'd like to see in terms of other opportunities to engage um, and ways to come together so that we can continue to share our experiences, our feminist realities and propositions and kind of continue to foster more mutual solidarity with each other. Yes, and please, Join us if you're not a member already. And I know many of us all are, so thank you so much again for your participation. Back to you, Sam. I think, uh, just to summarize, Leila has shared a link around membership and joining a membership. So if you're not a member, please join. And on our website, you'll be able to see a link around the online space that will be specifically for AWID members, just so that we are more connected uh, in this moment and obviously going forward. Um, and yes, final call <laughs> to fill out the survey um, before we get all our goodbyes. Thank you, everyone. Maggie, you can say a quick bye. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Goodbye. Thanks everyone for connecting. Hope we keep talking. Thank you everyone. Hambatle. Um, Erica. Goodbye. It's actually a practice that we have in APC. We might do a visual at the beginning and at the end, but not the whole time for connectivity reasons. So goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone. Time so that people can fill out the survey, but I think now we are up until the end of, of the call. Thank you so much for joining and um, hope to see you in next week's Twitterthon and some of the activities that we'll be inviting you to join us. Thank you and bye-bye.